So I, I'm David Holman. I'm not Christian Trot, but Christian is the, the PI of this, this project, so I left his name there. I'm over here. But uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk uh, about Cocoa's performance portability ecosystem. Um, and I'm just going to start off with kind of a, a brief justification here. There's this, this industry estimate um, that's been pretty solidly refined uh, that uh, counting all of the phases of software design from the actual design of the, the project to the implementation of the code to the testing to the refinement to the maintenance, you can a, a professional software engineer can do about 10 lines of code per hour, um, per, per man hour, right? Um, I mean, that says something about how software engineering works. There's a lot of steps in the process. It's not just writing the code, right? Um, and so, uh, if we look at all of the, the new platforms coming online uh, in the next uh, few years, the Exascale era, with Intel now having their own GPUs um, that are going to be programmed completely differently from all the NVIDIA GPUs, um, all of the different accelerator ecosystems, some of the talk about FPGAs being the future for certain uh, applications, there's a lot of code rewriting that needs to happen. I mean, optimistically, 10% of an application. Pessimistically, it can be far more than that, right? Um, sometimes it can be an entire rewrite of the entire application. And uh, so typical applications, around half a million lines of code in, in our world, and these are in terms of production applications that use large portions of uh, the time on these uh, giant supercomputers. Um, Sandia maintains a lot of these. If you uh, look, if you multiply this all out, you're talking about five man years to 20 man years sometimes uh, to do these refactorings, and we'd have to be doing 20 man years of work, you know, every year or so with the uh, current churn. Uh, if we were to write specifically to these platforms, and that's that's not really acceptable. So if you look at the situation coming up um, uh, with all the platforms that uh, the code at, at Sandia, at least, um, and in general, the National Labs has to be able to run on. We have uh, Trinity that came online recently. Uh, Summit Summit was just recently benchmarked as the Summit and Sierra both were benchmarked as number one and two in the world um, on the top 500 list. Uh, Aurora is coming in 2021. Uh, and Astra is, uh, I believe, just came online at Sandia. All four of these have completely different architectures. This is a this is a, an ARM cluster. Uh, this is going to be Intel GPUs. Uh, this was Intel Phi, uh, which yeah, pro appropriate response. Uh, uh, and this is uh, NVIDIA GPUs, right? And so if we were to 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 do this mapping, right? We have an enormous amount of software. Uh, engineering effort that would have to go into this to, for each application to handle each of these platforms separately. And then we're adding, you know, an exponential explosion every single time we add a new uh, uh, cluster, right? Um, and for a number of reasons, that's just, that's not really acceptable use of taxpayer money. It's not an acceptable use of uh, funding for any scientific uh, application or framework. Uh, so Cocos is, is designed to be the go-between here, where we have uh, a layer that uh, applications uh, can write to, and we will do, we, we provide the programming model, right, a, a restricted set of things that you're allowed to do, that we are confident through expert analysis, through thinking about this for a long time, and working with this for a long time, we provide a set of things that we allow you to do, that we are confident we can map, in a performant way to all of these um, to all of these new architectures, and we get our hands on these things a lot earlier than the applications can, uh, simply because we have already built up so many layers of libraries on top of us, and uh, you know these guys, some of whom have layers in between us and them, uh, they need to on day one of these giant machine launches, they need to be running, they need to be able to get the numbers, they need to be able to get the um, the impressive benchmarks that are going to go into the newspapers, right? And so, you know, we've been, this one comes online 
scheduled to come online in 2021. We've been working with their simulator for about a year now. Um, and we're finally getting our hands on first pieces of hardware in a non-disclosure agreement environment. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's still 2019. Uh, so we get a bit of a head start also. So that's another reason to, to think about using Cocos. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the Cocos ecosystem, uh, kind of our abstractions and our capabilities. Uh, I'm gonna walk through an example. Uh, I'm gonna talk, talk about some, some, some tools. Um, and I'm gonna talk about like where, where uh, uh, several applications, very important applications that are using Cocos and talk about where we go from, from here, what's, what's next in uh, Cocos and in, in, in uh, Cocos as a programming model. So what is Cocos? Um, so we, we like to use this term, a programming model for performance portability. Practically speaking, that means it's a library. Uh, we're not implementing a language. We're not changing uh, compilers, uh, although there's oftentimes we wish we could, but this should be just not the scale of effort that is reasonable uh, within C++. Modifying a C++ compiler is a massive, massive, massive effort. Um, we leave that to the Googles and Facebooks of the world that have budgets larger than the entire Department of Energy um, for such things. Uh, so, uh, but we do aim to align with developments in the C++ standard um, because that's the direction that those big companies are going to be going with the compilers and with the optimizations they make. Uh, and we, we tend to try and approach things from a descriptive programming models perspective rather than a prescriptive programming models perspective. If you're familiar with the world of programming models, um, you know that there's this big debate between descriptive prescriptive models. And the debate usually goes pretty much the same way. Um, it's everyone, whatever layer of the stack you're at, it's everyone telling people below them they want a very prescriptive model. And it's everyone telling people about them they want to deliver a descriptive model. Uh -huh. so, we are, we are one of those uh, Legos in that stack of everyone trying to tell each other things. But we certainly, to our customers, deliver something that's very descriptive. Um, you're, you're not supposed to be able to tell us the number of threads to run on. You just tell us that your work is parallel here. And here, are the, here's the forward progress model. Yeah? Yeah, so, so just to understand, like, descriptive means what? For example, I have whatever structure, meaning apply that function to that structure, but you don't describe exactly how you traverse it or something. Exactly. It's, it's, this is the idea. It's the what and not the how. That's right. right. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. So, and this, this, I mean, I've learned more and more recently that this, this pattern is repeated throughout software stacks yeah, sure. across everywhere. I was talking to some of the um, very low-level engineers at, at, um, at uh, NVIDIA recently, and so I don't know probably not very familiar with NVIDIA's uh, in, uh, infrastructure software stack, but their they're, um, assembly language, effectively. They have, they have two, really. They have um, an assembly language that they guarantee will be persistent across multiple releases called PTX. Or PTX. Um, and then below that, each individual release, in each individual release of a new card has um, a non-public assembly language called SAS, and that's what actually gets translated into the micro-instructions that run on the GPU. So there's, there's three layers there, actually. There's the, the people who actually write the silicon that generates the micro-instructions, and there's the people who design the SAS, and there's the people that map the SAS to the PTEC. And I was sitting, and so this is like super, super far below the stack, below us on the stack, right? And I was sitting at dinner with a PTEC and a SAS engineer, and they were debating about how the PTEC people want a they want a more prescriptive programming model from the SAS people, and the SAS people want to give the PTEX people a more descriptive programming model. So this happens all the way up and down the stack. Um, but we have reasons to believe that we are aligning ourselves in as much in as much as possible with providing a uh, prescriptive, uh, descriptive programming model to the user uh, that restricts them in certain ways that we think are not. Uh, healthy for scalable uh, software design in a performance portable environment. So, um, and we work directly with a lot of these, these libraries. Uh, 
we expand to meet their needs, we move this level of descriptiveness up and down, right? So sometimes the um, right level of descriptiveness is uh, directly at the linear algebra itself, um, and you lose information if you translate the uh, a blast call, for instance, into loops, right? And then recovering that information within the programming model in order to do an efficient matrix multiply uh, is, is nearly impossible. It's, it, very very hard thing to do, right? And so moving, so we have we have uh, Cocos uh, kernels ecosystem that sits on top of us, uh, which I believe is on the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Cocos kernels that sits on top of Cocos core. And if you have a problem that's already kind of describing Cocos kernels, so this is linear algebra kernels. This is a lot of blasts. This is a lot of pack. Uh, it's some graph algorithms. It's uh, it's expanded on request. We have clients that need things uh, in, implemented in that ecosystem. Um, we take pull requests in from them. We take uh, we do collaborations with people to expand the Cocos kernels ecosystem. But this is what I mean by and, and then even above that we have Trilinos, which has uh, quite a few other uh, more even more domain specific um, uh, descriptive programming model features. Um, and so this is what I mean by we, we kind of vary the descriptiveness, prescriptiveness up and down the stack. But uh, at its core, which is what I'm going to talk about today, Cocos is this, this set of parallel execution algorithms and parallel data structures. Um, and then uh, we map all of that to uh, many core GPUs like, uh, like Intel 5. We map this to. Um, uh, CPU plus GPU uh, infrastructure um, and all of the different uh, architectures that people need to run on, um, particularly to have success at the national labs, but in general in scientific computing. Um, here are a few people, the, the few of the places that are contributing to Cocos actively right now. Uh, since this slide was made, I believe uh, we picked up someone, oh no, we picked up someone from Berkeley just recently. Um, so, quite a large team uh, who have contributed to Cocos Core. Um, we're now at the point where uh, when a new machine is going to come online at a major national lab like Argonne, we're uh, generally trying to go through a process where that laboratory brings someone on to staff directly, who's specifically responsible for the performance of Cocos on that cluster um, and in that architecture. Um, so it, it's, I mean, we're at the point that when someone is spending two or three years of their lives trying to map this model, um, or several people, onto a supercomputer, it's going to be pretty hard to beat that in an application-specific way, uh, unless you're um, something of a wizard. Uh, so Cocos core abstractions, like I said, split into data structures and core execution. Uh, we have this thing uh, called an execution space, which kind of uh, generically describes the where and uh, memories, sorry, yeah, describes the where of execution and a memory space which describes the where of, uh, of data, right? We have memory layouts, we have execution patterns. Uh, these are all described in a very uh, concept-driven approach, um, very similar to kind of how uh, the standard template library works uh, within C++ itself. Um, and, and a lot of this is feeding back into design for future parts of the standard. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, towards the end. So uh, from an overview perspective, I'm going to go through some of these things a little bit more in detail. But we have uh, parallel, parallel loop patterns, uh, parallel uh, reductions. Um, we have uh, execution policies for tightly nested loops and for uh, non-tightly nested uh, hierarchical parallelism. Uh, we have experimental support for um, tasks, uh, microtasking uh, on GPUs, uh, which I will talk a little bit about. Um, it's not really, it's in production. Um, yeah, I, I'll say more about it later, but uh, it's, it's, it's not as, it's not as genu general as it sounds to just call it tasking. Um, we are general, we're in the process of generalizing, but we kind of need some 
application drivers to really understand where to invest time in generalizing. Uh, we have this view, multidimensional array data structure, which uh, has driven the design of uh, MD span and MD array in the, the standard, single school standard coming up, uh, MD span going into 23. Um, and uh, we uh, do, so fundamentally we have a philosophy that involves uh, don't make uh, expensive things implicit. So uh, since data transfer to, a, to and from a GPU um, is potentially expensive, we don't make it implicit. There's no implicit data transfer in, in Cocos. You have to do it yourself. Um, so you can point to a line and say, that's where my cost is coming from. Um, and uh, that's, by the way, a big debate within this community of, uh, go ahead. Well, because I was going to ask that too, because I mean, I, I'm really um, sympathetic to like all these different goals, of course, but, but then is there a tension always between that, that philosophy and then the idea of this descriptive programming between hiding costs or making them implicit, but then also in the descriptive, or is yeah. those not really intentional? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they are um, opposite okay. directions. I think there is there is a non-orthogonal component to those pulls, and you really want to pull on that non-orthogonal component as much as you can, right? Um, and this is an example of that, I think. Um, I think that you can be, this is this is actually, I would say, still uh, a descriptive way of doing a deep copy in a sense. In a sense, you're saying, make this data available on that memory space. Um, but if this data is already on that memory space, this is a no-op, right? It's still describes something rather than um, prescribes something, right? So they, if this were prescriptive, this would actually involve the take the data at this address and move it to that address um, or copy it to that address, right? Um, whereas this is this is a much more, I can totally understand where you're coming from with that question, um, but yeah, what you allow or require the user to describe uh, can still have some leeway. There's still some leeway to decide that within the world of descriptive models. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and OpenMP has made similar decisions to this. If you look at the way OpenMP uh, target offload has been designed in OpenMP 4.5 and OpenMP 5, they consider themselves to be a very descriptive programming model. Um, and in general, the whole Pragma programming community thinks of themselves as very descriptive. And they still have explicit uh, data transfer. Um, so yeah, uh, because often going back and forth between, so, so another project that has done this, um, uh, same kind of thing that we're doing is, is the Raja project at Lawrence Livermore, which you may have heard of. Uh, they have a layer on top of them called Chai, which is, I don't even know what it stands for, but Basically, it does the same thing, um, same kinds of things as us, same parallel for, parallel reduce type things, except for they don't have this. They don't have explicit deep copy. They have uh, implicit capture of um, their equivalent of the view data structure, and that does automatic copy. And like the first thing they tell all their applications to do is like uh, turn certain things off because the first thing, the first mistake they all make is data goes to the GPU, data comes back to the host, data goes to the GPU, data comes back to the host on things that really should just stay on the GPU. Um, so we saw that. I mean, we saw, we foresaw that. We also saw it in other places, and that's part of our reason for that decision. So anyway, we had generic uh, version of Atomics also, um, and uh, a number of different execution spaces, um, the kinds of things that we're working with. Um, and uh, we have this broader pool of capabilities. I won't go through any of these uh, specifically, but we can talk uh, more about any of these later if you're interested in them. Um, Question. Yeah? Your views are owning, right? Yes, unfortunately. So, well, so, so if I have already some data somewhere, how can I just use the code? There is a non-owning version of the view. Ah, it's okay. called Cocos Unmanaged. 
Um, there, they, you can give Cocos Unmanaged as the data data policy. So you may have a code where you already have, you know, containers, whatever it is, and then you want to just take a view on that and use your parallel for it, whatever. Yeah. And that's possible? That is possible, okay. yes. Um, I personally would, unless you need to use deep copy, if you're already managing the data and moving the data to the GPU yourself and all of that other stuff, I would just use MD span directly. Because um, that's, that's actually going into production now. Um, that said, there is a Cocos unmanaged. That was, I mean, that's an example of uh, something I think that we made a mistake on very early on is that we were not very specific about data ownership. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the same. Yeah. Uh, exactly the same for everything. Yes. Yeah. The views are not owning in C++. Yes. So. Yes. So view should not be so named view, view. whatever. And, and just to make sure I understand your answer, like, are you saying that, like, um, about using MD span that, that Cocos is like generic code, so you could just not use the one that's provided and switch to the one from the standard and exactly okay exactly exactly uh, deep copy won't work, but we will probably relatively soon provide an overload of deep copy that works with MD span okay. like special special versions of MD span. Um, but yeah, if you already have the data on the device and you just want to use the Cocos just, way of accessing it, yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so I think we're walking through a specific example here um, of a CG solve. Uh, so this particular example uh, does uh, vector addition. It does a dot product. does a sparse matrix vector multiply. Um, so we can't just directly call blast for all of these things. I mean, this, this third one is sure implemented in some places, but it's probably too general, so we, this is actually a pretty good example. So we, we want to start with a, uh, a view. Oh, and here it, it is, right, memory traits unmanaged. Also, our PI, for whatever reason, hates spacing, so I apologize for the space lack of, or lack thereof um, in these slides, but it, it makes me cringe. I don't know if it makes you cringe at all, but anyway. <laughs> um, and so, so we're gonna. So we already have the data somewhere. So we're gonna create an unmanaged view here. Uh, we're gonna create a managed view for the, uh, which is the default for uh, one of the intermediates uh, that's maybe uh, gonna be on the device. And then we do deep copy here, right? Um, and uh, this will just be a, uh, since this is uninitialized, this is just gonna be a, a transfer of the pointer. Um, in the on the host case, but on the device case, we actually have to set up this memory uh, and move the data over. So we do the optimal thing as much as possible um, whenever we can in this in this type of model. So you say this memory is on the host, the other one is on the let's say GPU. Yeah, and it's part of the type, right? Um, so what this is hiding, uh, since you guys are a little more advanced in your C++ than most people that we give this talk to. This is hiding a default template parameter that's defaulted exactly. uh, based on build system okay. things. But you can be actually much more explicit. See, this says host space. We can actually specifically put in there CUDA space. Okay. Or if you want to be more general, you probably put this in a function somewhere that gets called with a parameter that is your execution space. Okay. Right. So I could define something on the host, something on the GPU, and transfer it in. Yep, exactly. Okay. Um, or you can define something on default memory yeah. space, right? And then you can change whether it's on the GPU or CPU based on your build system. Is it important to understand what XN and the string X are doing here, or not, not so much? Uh, well, XN, that's let's XN. see. Is it important? Mm -hmm. XN is your input data. Is, is it? Okay. Yeah, XN is the input data. You take a view on it, okay. then you work. Yeah. Okay. But in the next one, it's a string? Like that's something else? Or... What? Oh, no. These are just labels. These are profiling labels. The strings are just profiling labels. I'm sorry, oh, that's no. that's not clear. This is part of the reason why C++ desperately needs keyword arguments. That's another discussion. Yeah, it does. I, I have pushed on the C++ committee for that for ever since anyone would listen to it. But um, so yeah, we need to for uh, the AX plus Y. We need. Um, this, this simple loop, so here's the serial implementation. We need this simple 
uh, loop where we scale something up in in Cocos, you just basically replace this with parallel four. We have this fancy uh, schmancy macro Cocos lambda, which is on the host just translates into square bracket equals close square bracket, right? On the device translates into, or if you're compiling for CUDA, translates into square bracket equals close square bracket, fancy schmancy device marking nonsense that CUDA makes us do. Um, and on architectures that we can't even talk about right now, um, has to do some other things also. So we hide that behind a macro for you so that your code is portable and doesn't have to be changed at all uh, as, as things move forward. And actually, as, as these new architectures are coming out, we kind of basically demand that they give us something that we can hide behind that, right? Um, so that users don't have to change their code. Go ahead. So, Capture. Capture? Can yes. Capture? This is cap. This this hides a capture. Yeah, it's equals capture. Oh. It is not reference capture because obviously the reference doesn't make no, any no, sense. No. That's that's my question. Yeah, the reference doesn't make any sense on the GPU, right? Uh, um, of course. So uh, it has to be done by value, um, and actually, uh, that is a problem, like inside of a member function of a class, because you accidentally capture this pointer, right, uh, by value. Um, so if you follow C++ yeah. uh, progress, the, in C++ 17, we added a star of this. So that was a Sandia proposal that came out of Cocos. Okay. So if you've seen the star of this proposal that was accepted into 17, that is that, that came out of this work. But the bottom line is that you capture the external context. Yeah. What? You capture the ex you capture. Yeah, you capture the context. So yeah, here we're capturing the view. Uh, that was my question. Yeah, that's fine. Hopefully that. Makes sense, and, and maybe I should start writing it for, for these contexts. I should start writing it as you can also write it as a square bracket equals close square bracket cocos underscore function. So if the reader of your code is more aware of such things, so yeah, in cocos, um, all of our, uh, our 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 fundamental idiom or fundamental pattern involves uh, three components: the pattern. Oops, there's a string label for that's that's not fundamental. Pattern, uh, execution policy, and functor. I thought he was labeling these things differently than he is. Okay. You can add a, um, a string label for profiling. This is a the simplest possible execution policy, which is a shortcut for range policy of zero to n on the default execution space, right? Um, but n is the shortest way of saying that. Um, but uh, fundamentally, you, you, when you look at this thing, you look at the pattern, the policy, and the functor, which is this whole thing, and can obviously be a lam expressed as a lambda. Um, and you'll get an iteration handle, which the simplest version of an iteration handle is just an integer, right? So we have like shortcuts for a lot of these things, but they all simplify to very generalizable patterns. I think I'm going a little too slow, so I might need to speed up a little bit. All right, so uh, now if you go to the dot product, right, you can't just express that as a parallel four. And it's, uh, this is actually uh, incredibly non-trivial to write in CUDA. If you've ever tried to write a device size um, reduction in CUDA, uh, it's something on the order of uh, a thousand lines of code to do it passably, just to do a dot product, and to do it uh, at the device size uh, limit. And to do it optimally, it can be five-ish thousands of thousand lines of code. Um, you have to do, anyway, there's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff you need to do there. Uh, but in, in Cocos, it, it basically just results in this same exact thing, right? We have a parallel pattern um, a functor, uh, the reductions in Cocos output via an argument, um, which is actually uh, something we did just for performance purposes when we designed Cocos way back 10 years ago, but uh, is actually an emerging uh, paradigm in, uh, in uh, programming model design in more general contexts. Uh, Facebook is a big fan of this right now. Um, for a lot of their software stacks, the same kind of thing. 
the more general version of this, they're not passing in a reference and then outputting via it, but um, it facilitates a lot more general uh, programming model patterns in a, in a number of ways. Uh, and so that's, um, that, but it, it's, you can see this is how this is very similar um, in form to the uh, parallel four that we had on the previous slide. Is that supposed to be x dot y? I'm confused. Where's some coming from? As the argument to the function. Basically. Right. So we output via an argument, right? Yeah. So, because um, if we were to capture by reference, right, then the reference wouldn't mean the same thing on the CPU and the GPU, right? It's a pointer, right? So we, this is what I was trying to talk about earlier about restricted programming models, right? This is, we restrict what the user's allowed to do. You're not allowed to capture things by reference in the Cocos programming model because then it would not be, there's no, be a, there's no way to make it portable, right? So, um, so the sparse, sparse matrix vector multiply, this is a, a pretty good for, I think he's gonna go talk about, yeah. This is, this is a good place for talking about the kind of hierarchical parallelism we might need. So we, here's the serial version. We have a, an outer loop over matrix rows, an inner loop over the uh, dense vector, um, and we're doing uh, kind of random access. Um, and here's the same thing kind of written in Cocos. So I won't dwell on this because I'm running out of time and have other interesting, I'm less than halfway through and I have interesting other things to talk about. But uh, basically we provide a way to do hierarchical parallelism. We, we allow you to create teams of threads. Remember I said earlier that the iteration index is, is um, the, the simplest version of the team handle, right? So here's our, um, here's our, uh, here's the team handle, and the team handle allows you to uh, do hierarchical parallelism uh, on multiple levels. Um, currently, we support three levels. I'm working very hard to generalize that and to kind of generalize the naming scheme of them so that it's just a three level, multi level uh, parallelism uh, described um, rather than prescribed as much as it is currently. Um, and so you can, you can again see, it's a little bit more complicated, but you see pattern, policy, and functor, right? And, and everything, pretty much everything in Cocos is, um, well, that's not true, but many, much of Cocos is uh, code follows this same direction. And we, we have, even in the nested versions, we have pattern, policy, and functor. Um, you're capturing by reference here uh, because this is allowed. This is within the GPU, right? Um, you can capture by by value also. It doesn't really hurt. Um, so performance. Um, here's some some plots comparing us with uh, with code written directly to other programming models. Uh, and uh, on, on various architectures, we have um, uh, AX plus BY, we have a uh, dot product. Oh, higher is better. Like, why, why are we so slow compared to OpenMP? But no, um, <laughs> OpenMP has problems with reductions, so I was like, so yeah, higher is better. Performance uh, per uh, is is in gigaflops per second. OpenMP not study Yeah, OpenMP reductions have problems. I think they've gotten a little better since we made this chart, but they're not significantly better. Uh, and so you can see that in, in many cases we're actually outperforming the native. Like, how in the world are we faster than uh, than CUDA on a GPU? Right. I mean that seems insane, and that's because we. We know things that a typical CUDA programmer doesn't know. We, hit, we, we get some secret sauce from NVIDIA directly. We talk to them a lot. We put in all kinds of little uh, tricks that a typical CUDA programmer is not going to know. Even an advanced, computer, advanced CUDA programmer is not going to know. And so we're actually uh, we're 
better than zero overhead in many cases, um, which is uh, a pretty strong statement. And, and yeah. Um, I'm going to skip tasking, even though it's the part of Cocos that I wrote. Um, and I'll come back to it if I have time. Um, so Cocos kernels, um, I've heard a lot of people that I've talked to so far here say that they mostly just call blast. Um, so we have an equivalent of just call blast. It's Cocos kernels. Um, and it, well, one of the interfaces that we allow very much looks like just call blast. Um, it's for you to use views instead of pointers. And uh, you don't have to do all this D, Z, C, S nonsense <laughs> because we live in C++ world. Um, so uh, yeah, they're agnostic to scalar type. They call vendor libraries whenever available. So you still don't have to write your code to think about Kublas or uh, to call M uh, MKL directly. Um, so we, yeah, we handle all of that. Uh, and when implementations aren't available, like for newer uh, hardware, uh, we have a reference implementation that's generally, hopefully, uh, fast enough for most purposes. Um, and these can also be called uh, in nested contexts. And in a nested context, we'll, we'll do the right thing. So if you're inside, so if you were to just call blast directly here, uh, you would, uh, the default implementation of blast would try and use all of the threads on the machine, right? And if you're already in a context where you're parallelizing over all the threads in the machine, you actually probably just want to use all the threads in the team, right? Um, which might be, uh, all the threads in the team might be all of the hyper threads on one thread, or if you if we're at a place where we're mapping teams to uh, cores uh, or to sockets even, uh, depends on how the problem is set up and how uh, the performance characteristics you need. Uh, but in general, this uh, Cocos kernels works with hierarchical parallelism. Um, we have a oh, question. Yeah, quick question. You map the whole blast on LAPAC as well? Uh, I not want to do an LU decomposition. What? I want to do an LU decomposition. Yeah, we do have LU decompositions. Yeah. Um, so the most common thing. We have a lot of the most common things. We have all of the things that Sandia definitely needs. For example, like compute determinants, you know, this sort of Yes. Thing. We have, we're missing a lot of things that a lot of other people need, but uh, if you put in a request, it'll probably happen. Like, um, okay. that team, uh, yeah, does a, does a lot of new work. Um, but wrapping something is not all that hard in, in general. And we have a lot of linear algebra experts at Sandia, world experts in linear algebra at Sandia that do this work very well. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, Cocos tooling, uh, we recently pulled on a, a new uh, David Polyakov, a new uh, staff member who's basically uh, in charge of this now and uh, is uh, driving this forward at a much faster rate uh, than before. But we provide a, a number of basic sets of tools uh, that can even hook in via environment variables and uh, via dynamic linking. Um, some of our applications that we work with are so complex, they take three to five hours to recompile. Um, and obviously, recompiling in debug mode is not really a, um, to recompile the whole thing, not an individual translation unit. But, um, it, you know, recompiling the entire tool chain just to do some uh, debugging is, is not really an option for them. So we provided these sorts of tools uh, in that respect. We also have, and, and these labels that we've been showing along the way, right, these, lab, these, are, these are optional. Um, but if you put them in there, the Cocos tooling will use them. Um, and so they'll give you a good display. And they interact with a number of um, other parts of the ecosystem. Uh, for more information, look at the 
Cocos tooling repository, Cocos tooling repository on the Cocos uh, GitHub uh, group. So everything that Cocos does can be found uh, on github.com slash Cocos. And so like Cocos core is github.com slash Cocos slash Cocos. Um, and Cocos tooling is all in github.com slash Cocos slash Cocos tooling, Cocos dash tooling. And Cocos dash kernels is another uh, important repository there. So if there's something that's not on Cocos tooling that you want, put it in an issue and someone will address it. If there's something on, missing on Cocos kernels, put it in an issue, someone will address it. We have one of our, one of our goals um, on the Cocos team um, one of the one of our milestones is to try and get our issue response time down, our average issue response time below 24 hours. So, one of those milestones that we're not really allowed to fail. So if we do, we you know we should be responding pretty quickly. Point. Um, and and uh, that doesn't mean that we'll implement your feature in 24 hours, but <laughs> we'll, we'll write a response and say, hey. Uh, We'll do that in, in a year, maybe, or no. <laughs> or, or, or we'll write a response saying, yeah, somebody's been working on that for the past six months. It'll be coming online in the next three days or something, um, if you're lucky. Um, yeah, so uh, we also have a Slack, cocosteam.slack.com or whatever. Um, I think you have to email us to get onto that Slack, um, but it's pretty easy. Uh, so we have a pretty, pretty rapid response on the Slack to issues. Um, so, DOE machine announcements. Uh, so, yeah, like I said earlier, we have all of these machines coming on uh, that are uh, all have different programming models um, and all have different uh, hardware, and it's not really reasonable for. Um, people to rewrite their code every time a new thing comes out. We were actually, uh, so this is a funny story here. Uh, for the AMD GPUs, we were, I told, told you guys we'd get early access to a lot of things. Um, the problem with the AMD GPUs is that we got such early access um, that they gave us something that they decided to abandon and we'd already written our back end in it. Oh. And uh, then a number of our competitors actually got the uh, got access after they decided to abandon Rockham, and so um, several of our competitors are slightly ahead of us on this, <laughs> embarrassingly, uh, because we did a full-scale implementation of something AMD corporately decided to abandon and didn't tell us until too late. So yeah, that was fun. Um, but uh, so we have single backends in pro progress. We have an OpenMP target backend, uh, which is going to hit some of the AMD uh, clusters and some of the newer NVIDIA clusters with certain requirements. Um, in terms of projects currently running, um, actual full-on production code, you know, code bases with on the order of half a million to a million lines of code, we have about 12. Um, and so these are projects that have probably, uh, depending on the project, 20 to 50 developers on them. Um, and uh, production codes that are code bases, <coughs> excuse me, give me a second, that are in the process of porting something like 35. Most of those are committed from a funding perspective to getting a working Cocos implementation up and running uh, and showing results by the end of their funding period, whatever that period is. Um, we now, now have a number of uh, packages that are in these large collections, um, things like parts of uh, Trulinos. Um, if you're not familiar with Trulinos, you can think of it as like, kind of like Boost. Like This would be like saying that a part of Boost is using us, so tpetro is, is a part of Trulinos in the same way that I don't know, um, Boost uh, MPL is a part of, of uh, Boost. Um, so, uh, and then a number of other proxy apps, packages evaluating Cocos. Some of these things are like um, single research group at some university or something 
Um, here's a impressive logo cloud of about, nah, this is about two thirds of the people collaborating with us probably. Uh, probably half of these people, half of these corporations have at least two projects, or half of these logos have at least two projects. And there's some, several on there that we can't even talk about yet um, for whatever reason, but um, yeah. Uh, boy, what do I have, 10 minutes left? Okay, these are important applications using Cocos. Um, I will send out these slides afterwards and you can um, ask these people about their experience, um, but I won't go too much into details here. I wanna talk a little bit about how we've uh, kind of, our experience with this um, process of uh, this cycle of, of adding a feature to Cocos, uh, proposing a, a generalized version of it for the C++ standard, uh, and backporting those versions um, to something Cocos can depend on. Uh, this, is, this was really the process for MD span. This was the process for Atomic Ref, which was also um, a contribution we made. Uh, so Atomic Ref uh, allows you to make um, atomic operations on uh, non-atomic entities. So if you're familiar with atomics in C++, they, um, the non-ref versions have to be atomics for their whole life. And if you want them to be non-atomic, you have to move the memory. Well, that's not really acceptable for gigabytes of memory, right? If you only need to do one reduction over the entire lifetime of the data and all of the other um, stuff is uh, non-concurrent, uh, all the other axes, accesses are non-concurrent, then uh, that's a deal breaker. But uh, this, in C++ 20, we will have atomic ref. Um, it works exactly like you'd expect. All the operations that are available on atomic are available on atomic ref. Um, there are certain requirements on what you can put in there, but all the things that you guys would want to put in there, you can put in there. Um, floats, doubles, complex, ints. Um, and kind of basic structures. Um, MD span, uh, if you're interested in MD span more, I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow morning in more of a kind of discussion feedback format. I have about 20 minutes of slides or so, but we're going to have a kind of open discussion as to how that process goes and how that went. Um, I do have a production implementation of that. Um, you guys were this trip was a specific motivating factor to get this thing done um, in enough time to be here so that if there's nothing that you, if you can't commit wholesale to trying to use Cocos, um, you at least can take this header only library, play around with it, see if it gives you any, see if it gives you what you need for your um, code. Um, and uh, we also making contributions to uh, linear algebra, basic linear algebra um, in the standard. So basically, uh, C++ standard blasts um, uh, books, um, which don't look at all like blasts, but that's okay. Um, I don't think anyone is super attached to the way blast looks, only the way it performs. So uh, we are doing this in a way that we are confident that uh, the non-HPC parts of the C++ uh, committee can swallow them, and the performance sensitive parts of the HPC community can swallow them. Um, uh, so that's the, the big challenge there. And we have some of the world's experts in linear algebra on that proposal. Uh, Jack Vera from Tennessee is an author on that proposal. Mark Holman from, um, from Sandia, who's uh, led many of the largest distributed memory uh, linear algebra efforts out there, is, is also uh, he's the, the lead author on the proposal. So we got, a, we got together a whole bunch of people who really know what they're doing, and uh, hopefully that's going to work out pretty well. Uh, and then executors, I could talk for hours on executors. Uh, if you're particularly interested in the history of executors on uh, C++, uh, look up my talk uh, at C++ Now this year. Um, it's, uh, there's a whole lot going on there, and I don't want to kind of uh, give the wrong impression by trying to give a really short summary here. Um, but yeah, just look up my name on YouTube and C++ Now 2019. Uh, 
Okay, yeah, this is about how we are orienting Cocos uh, towards executors for C++23. Um, I'm going to skip that also. Again, refer you to the presentation. Here's a bunch of links. Um, again, I'll send this present. I guess I send this to Mary Kate, and she'll send it around. Or yes, I think we can do that. Okay, great. Um, yeah, uh, we have some several recorded talks on Cocos. We have several publications on Cocos. Um, like I mentioned, the GitHub uh, is where you find all of our code, and uh, the presentation on YouTube about executors, uh, welcome to look up. And that's it. So I guess I skipped all the right numbers of things. I hope I skipped the things that you guys wanted me to skip. <laughs> um, but questions, yeah.